Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy. I'm Steve, and we are a member of the Agora Podcast Network. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find both by searching for A2Z History. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can always send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com. Let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the History of the Papacy diptychs. We have Yoren and William at the Alexandria level. We also have Paul the Magnificent at Constantinople. I need to also thank Katya for her kind and generous donation on PayPal. Thank you very much, Katya. Definitely check out the new and improved History of the Papacy Patreon page at his- patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. There we have at the new Patreon, you'll get as some of your benefits, there's many benefits, but one of the new benefits from the old Patreon is that you'll get an audio feed of our new YouTube series, which will launch soon called the history of the papacy in 10 minutes. And uh, at every level, you will get ad free episodes as well as you will also get the each episode early published early in the history of the papacy bonus feed so definitely look for all of those and at different levels you'll also be entered into a monthly drawing for history of the papacy swag as long as the as well as the history of the papacy book drawing which is really cool Now for today's episode, Moses had a great career, but he wasn't able to enter the promised land. The Old Testament picks up the rest of the story with the person who was able to lead the chaotic, violent, and sometimes boring narrative of the Hebrew people's conquest of Canaan. Come and listen as Gary Stevens and I take you on a guided tour of the book of Joshua, I hope to see you on YouTube, Patreon, social media, right here on the podcast, and I will definitely talk to you next time. Welcome back to another exciting collaboration between the history and the Bible podcast and the History of the Papacy podcast. Today, our task will be to turn the microscope on one of the most interesting and controversial books of the Bible, that being the book of Joshua. Who was Joshua? Who wrote the book? Why would they write such a book? Many people have quite strong opinions on Joshua, including us, Gary and I. We are going to put Joshua on trial, but in a different way than we have in the past. So let's get into it. Gary, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. In splendid isolation. (laughs) Yeah, we should probably say at the point we are recording this episode in March of 2020, we are in the height of the coronavirus uh, epidemic, you might say, pandemic. And so we are both completely quarantined. We're six feet or two meters, if you prefer. (laughs) I don't want to, we're not going to offend anyone. We're well, (laughs) we're well apart from each other. Actually, we're probably what more close to about 10,000 miles apart right now. So we're, you know, we're more than we have more than a month, more than enough social distancing right now but we're not going to social distance on Joshua. Tell us a little, let's get close to Joshua right now, Gary. Tell us a little bit about Joshua and the book of Joshua. Yeah, Uh, let's start with the book itself. The book itself is considered to be the first of the histories in Christian tradition. In the Jewish tradition, it's considered to be the first of the former prophets or the early prophets. Joshua happens or is located straight after Deuteronomy. Uh, And Deuteronomy is basically Moses' many chapter long valedictory speech to his people. Joshua tells the story of the Israelite conquest of of what will soon be their homeland, ancient Canaan. It's a great story of conquest, full of blood and gore and violence, which I find a little disconcerting. And it is a story of triumph. The book depicts this period in the Israelites' history as 
as one of the the most perfect relationship with God that the Israelites ever have. Even under King David, the Israelites have somewhat of a, uh, a trepidatious relationship with God in that David often does the wrong thing. But in this period under Joshua, the Israelites' conquest is one of an absolutely perfect relationship with God. This is as best, as good as it will ever get in the entire history of the Israelites. God loves them. They love God. And in return, God gives them the promised land. Uh, the book itself is named after its leader, of course, Joshua, or in Hebrew, uh, Yehoshua, which means uh, God is salvation. Uh, his original name was Hoshea, and for reasons which the Bible doesn't actually specify, uh, Moses changes his name to Joshua. Joshua is an unusual man in the sense that before the conquest, the Israelites have spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. At the end of that 40 years, there are precisely three men living who were born in Egypt, Moses, Caleb the spy, and Joshua. So the entire male generation before has been utterly annihilated. And even Moses himself, of course, will not make it into the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb will. Now, oddly in the Bible, you'd think Joshua would get a, a really good rap as being the great leader who saw the Israelites, uh, well, win their promised land and the land which would become their homeland for all eternity. But weirdly, after the book that's named after him, he hardly ever appears, hardly ever. And when he does appear, or is mentioned, it's not often as a great warrior and leader. It's as Moses' successor. Uh, in the New Testament, I think he's mentioned a grand total of two times, just two times, that's it. And even in the rest of the Old Testament, he's hardly mentioned. So I find that a bit of a mystery. Why doesn't Joshua get, why isn't he ranked up there with Abraham and Isaac and, and Moses? Uh, just not quite sure. The book itself is devoted exactly in half. The first 12 chapters tell the story of the conquest. The second 12 chapters after the conquest has been brilliantly completed by Joshua and the Israelites. The second half is a really soporific story of which tribe gets which region and which towns. It's got to be... It is brutally boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it rivals the books of Chronicles for sheer soporific quality. It's just dreary. But I suppose if it acts... anybody's ever there um, who's gotten what um, they might call their abstract on their house of who's owned the house before them, uh, like my house, it's um, it goes back, at least the abstract goes back into the 1800s. Josiah so and so bought the tract in 1899 and it was sold to Henry, blah, blah, blah. And it go that's joshua to a t we're not we're not quite sure when the book was actually written one clue is in fact those those 12 boring chapters at the end because the towns named seem to correspond to the distribution of lands during the time of king josiah which is centuries centuries later uh, towards the very end of the kingdom of judea so maybe the book wasn't written until then others say ah no the distribution given in the last 12 chapters is quite probably the distribution under Solomon, King Solomon. So still, that would still make it written centuries after the time it was set. Uh, as to when this actually happened, the events it purports to record, they can be no earlier than 1200 BC. Now, let me give you an anchor for that. King David is 1000 BC, BCE, pretty much exactly. Nice, easy number, date and person to remember. So the whole thing, and, and 1200 BC, why is that the earliest time? Until then, the period before 1200 BC for several centuries is called the Late Bronze Age. This is one of the rare times in ancient history when Egypt maintained an empire outside its homeland. Until 1200 BC, Egyptian forts dotted Canaan, which was a subsidiary province of Egypt. So it, it's impossible that either the Exodus or the Book of Joshua happened before then because it was, it was an Egyptian province. So it has to have happened after 1200 BC. Now, 1200 BC is another important date because that's the beginning of a cataclysm called the Bronze Age Collapse. The Bronze Age Collapse lasted about um, 50, maybe 100 years, and the entire Middle East was thrown into turmoil. Egypt was kicked out of Canaan, uh, it was, and it was attacked by the mysterious sea peoples who may or may not have been Greeks or who knows. The Hittites were destroyed and disappeared from history right through to um, the entire region was thrown into absolute cataclysm. Cities were razed to the ground throughout the area. And this period lasted for 
as I said, maybe 100 years or so. And after that, we see the emergence of uh, the early Iron Age. So it could be that Joshua's time is placed in this period in the Bronze Age collapse. And it's part of that. We're really not quite certain. What is the maybe the modern Jewish interpretation of Joshua or, you know, modern being um, even into the rabbinical period? Have you uh, gotten into that in your research, what they think about him? Until this century, I think Joshua was perceived both by Christians and Jews as a story of triumph, as a story of a, a mighty leader, as, as the book presents itself to be. It wasn't until after the Second World War and the horrors of the Holocaust, that people started saying, mm, you know, maybe this sort of a let's kill all the Canaanites thing is a little bit on the nose. But until quite recently, how it's viewed today, I think I think still most Jews and Christians would regard it as a book of triumph, really. I, I did a little research into right. the Christian interpretation of it, just because I always like to see what, you know, what they're saying about it now. Um, I s really... Up until fairly recently, this is one of the ones <clears throat> where the in Christianity, there's always the battle between the historical and the allegorical view on mm. the Old Testament. And this is one of the ones where a lot of the people, they'll try and draw a really hard, uh, heavy, dark line between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Oh, yeah, Joshua is all allegorical and um you know yeah the yahweh of the old testament he wasn't necessarily a bad guy but you know the let's just forget about all that you know all the stuff that we've talked about in the past like samson and you know we're talking about joshua let's kind of just you know we'll we'll blur them out a little bit yeah they're they're there but jesus is the big guy and really anything will really pay attention to things that we say that have prefigured Jesus in the Old Testament. And we'll kind of forget about the stuff about killing everyone that happened in the Old Testament. Um, there was an interesting article that I had read from an Orthodox Christian um, a, a priest who said that this is probably, Joshua is probably one of the most difficult Old Testament books to interpret, because if you really play that game of, oh yeah, everything in the Old Testament's uh, uh, really just problematic, and let's really focus on the New Testament, then you're really turning it, you're becoming a Marcionite at that point. Um you know, or if you just say that, oh, it's a historical document of the real politic of the day, and it has no meaning for religion for today, it's that's also a either a cop out at best or straight Marcionism. And the U.S. the United States Conference of Catholic Roman Catholic bishops they had a write up that was basically to that point too that. It's, it's a really difficult book to jive with what they're what they're really trying to say in Christianity. You know, the whole thing, that whole half of the book where they, you know, they go and they kill every single living creature in the um, in the town. It's hard to jive that with the Christian message. And I think if you rewind all the way back to Marcion, that's what he was getting at. OK, I want to pick you up on that, continue that just in a second. But let's give our listeners an example of the campaigns in the book of Joshua. The book describes three campaigns. Each of them are launched out of the highlands or the hills of Canaan, which are basically um, a mountainous area which runs alongside the River Jordan. So it's in the east section. Uh, the western section of Canaan are basically plains, and these mountains run along the eastern side. So each campaign is launched from this really rough and ready area. The, there are three campaigns. One is uh, into northern areas, one into middle, and one into southern. The campaign is usually launched from the hills, which are pretty close to Jerusalem, a few kilometers north of Jerusalem. So that's literally in the middle, literally in the middle of Canaan. Uh, most of the action takes place actually in the area of the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin was one of those tribes which in later times lay on the boundary between the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes. The book of Joshua tends to be very pro the northern tribes. So remember, there's 10 in the north and there's two big ones in the south. Uh, because yeah, most of the action takes the, uh, place there. 
which is interestingly the exact opposite attitude of its Joshua's successor book, the Book of Judges, which hates the northern tribes. But anyway, in these campaigns, of which there are many famous scenes, a typical battle goes like this. Okay, Joshua 10.28. That day, Joshua took... Well, in English, it'd be Makedar, I suppose. But apparently it's Makedar or something. Anyway, I'll read one. That day, Joshua took Makedar. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everything in it. He left no survivors. And he did to the king of Makedar as he had done to the king of Jericho. And time and again, you will find that the book describes Joshua. He invades a town and he destroys everything. He destroys the men, the women, the children, sometimes the trees. And that happens again and again. But, but... This sort of account is actually seems to be fairly common in the Middle East. Uh, for example, you find the Assyrian kings saying exactly the, the, the same sort of, exactly the same sort of. So he, here's an account by King Sennacherib, and it says, In my first campaign, I accomplished the defeat of Merodach Baladan, king of Babylonia. In the midst of that battle, he deserted his camp, and he escaped alone. The chariots, horses, wagons, mules, which he left behind at the beginning of the battle, my hands seized. I entered jubilantly into his palace. I took his gold, silver, precious stones, goods and property, his harem, courtiers, official singers. <laughs> you can see the man cackling. So, so this, admittedly, does seem to be conventional rhetoric, whether it's true or not. You know, this is tough for me when I'm when I'm making this my job to convince you that it's not that, you know, that Joshua's not that big of a deal because... Who is Joshua? None of it really quite lines up to, is it historical? So if it's historical, then the, then the Israelites, these writers, 250, maybe 300 years later, are just copying Assyrian archetype writers. Um, there was a book I had read that was called Against the Grain, and it's, it's um, the subtitle is A Deep History of the Earliest States by um, the author's name is Richard Manning, and he writes a lot about um, different groups and how they interacted. It was basically the agricultural states, which maybe like Jericho and those early Canaanite states would have been, versus the more nomadic states. Uh, peoples who, in this case, the Israelites would have been. So in that telling, the Israelites would have been the good guys. But then you twist it around, and if the Israelites were, in fact, a offshoot of a mercenary uh, tribal people who had served under the Egyptians, who, for whatever reason, were either spun off of the Egyptians or didn't want to work for the Egyptian more. And then they go in and just basically start taking over these Canaanite sites, which would have been basically kind of related people mm -hmm. to them, you know, kind of cousins. They would have spoken a fairly similar language. They would have had a fairly similar religion, then clearly the Israelites are the bad guys in, in that scenario. It really depends on what perspective you look at them from whether what they're doing is justified or if it's completely unjustified. So I'm a really bad yeah. Hasa. I took your Hasatan hat today. Yeah. Um, it's too bad we're recording this for video and I didn't make a Hasatan hat. But... Uh, <laughs> It's 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 really difficult to make a coherent case against against or for, for Joshua because it's so blurry what who Joshua is. You mean Joshua the man with the whole Israelites? Either one. If Joshua is the leader of these Israelites, I mean, if you take Joshua and the idea that he's basically Moses light, he yeah. um, comes in, he especially the more boring parts of Moses where he's giving a detailed exemplar. Oh, you know, the curtains for the uh, holiest of holies have to be three cubits by six cubits, not, not one half cubit more or less. And that's basically what the second half of Joshua is after he's killed a bunch of people and um, presumably enslaved them. I mean, I don't think they talk about enslaving, but come on. There was a lot of it. There, there must yeah. have been some enslaving in there. Yeah. Let's not mince words here. Yeah. Actually, Joshua as Moses Light, the book does 
uh, give us several incidents where Joshua is exactly that. The classic one is just before the invasions, where the Israelites are gathered to the east of the River Jordan, and they're looking at Canaan. And what happens is the priests bring out the Ark of the Covenant, and the Jordan dries up so that they can march across it to get into Canaan. So Moses crossed the entire Red Sea, and Joshua gets to cross a little, little stream. So that is, <laughs> so that is a classic example. And there are some other instances where Joshua basically does something just like the great Moses, but it's several orders of magnitude more pathetic. But they do try to make the effort to draw power. I, mean, I think for me, there's two different Joshuas and two different Israelites. If we look at it from the standpoint of Israelites... Now, if I'm not mistaken, one of the possible datings of the writing of the book of Joshua is just about the time of the Persian conquest of Palestine. That would be a fairly late date, I think. Um, it's possible, but it'd still be fairly late. I, well, we don't know how long these things took to edit. and uh, They could have been centuries in progress. Yes, yeah, so that's possible. So let's say we take that one just for example, so that maybe that is a little late, but the Israelites are really small players in the big Western Asia game that's going on with the, you know, be it, yeah, tiny, tiny, tiny. I had seen somewhere that the Persians had a, uh, a mosaic or a stella where they had all the different peoples who had basically bowed the knee to the Persians and, every, you know, all the big players were in there. I believe the Philistines were in there, the Egyptians, even the Ionian Greeks who were basically as far away from as you could get to the Persians. And they were tiny, tiny players, but no Israelites <laughs> in there, no Judeans, no, um, you know, none of none of them. So I think, you know, so what do you do if you're trying to counteract that? You see mm. that you want to be players too. Well, let's write a book about it. We once were great and, and still are. You know, and I think that, so if you look at it from that point, how can you really be angry about Joshua about something that just probably didn't happen? Okay, okay. As we've discussed before, Steve, I don't like the book of John because it has so many of the, these ugly moments of kill, kill, kill. And actually, one thing about the kill, 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 it isn't just wanton slaughter. They use a, a very specific term. I'll get the Hebrew pronunciation wrong, but it's something like karem. Yeah. And in English, that's often translated as devoted to destruction. Karem refers to an object or a person, or it could be anything, which you destroy as a sacrifice to God. It is God's um, bounty, plunder, a, a prize for giving you victory. In battle, you must destroy these things, and you're not allowed to use them yourselves. Uh, and in fact, there's one incident in the book of Joshua with um, a guy called Akan. And Akan, instead of going through you know, whatever town they've just conquered and destroying everything, he grabs some of the gold and silver for himself. And then God, um, at the next town they come down, says, no, nah, one of you guys has been naughty. Joshua does some detective work, finds out that Akan has stolen some of these goods and kept them for himself and not given them to God. And the Israelites first stone and then burn to death his entire family. So they took it very seriously. And this concept of devoted to destruction does seem to have been used by other Middle Eastern peoples too. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just uh, an Israelite thing. Uh, I, I still find it... It's, at, it's, at, it's at it's best very unpleasant. It's distasteful. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yes. It's at best, it's distasteful. Yeah. I, as I read through Joshua, it just doesn't... The narrative doesn't make sense. It makes very much sense as an in the Iron Age context. It doesn't make sense in the Bronze Cage, uh, Bronze Age context to me, at least. I mean, I guess I should always preface that that I'm not a scholar of these things. But you know, doing my readings as a people, if they really are a group, whatever they, whatever their situation was when they were when they left Egypt. I mean, let's. Let's um, aver that they were actually from, they came out of Egypt and Jericho was the first town that they hit. Why, what is their intrinsic motivation to completely destroy it? I guess you could say that they, there are some motivations to completely destroy this town, 
But to me, it seems like a good place to, I don't, you know, I guess militarily to take hold, enslave the population, take their grain. It had a well, so it was a water source for them to move up the Jordan Valley to the you know, the richer places and maybe the more organized places. Yeah, I, I take your point. And actually, there's, um, that relates to a story which I think was told of when the king of Persia conquered the Medians. And the story goes, the king of Persia has conquered Medea and he has the king of Medea or Media there. And he's gloating at the, the king of Media. And the king of Persia says, see how I'm destroying your cities. And the king of Media says, no, sire, I see that you are destroying your cities. Yeah, so what, what is the, the point of destroying a whole city? But on the other hand, something which has always intrigued and puzzled me is the entire concept of sacrifice at all. Throughout the Middle East, and particularly by the Israelites, they sacrificed constantly throughout their history. Um, you're always meant to go up to Jerusalem for the big festivals and, and sacrifice uh, some grain or a pigeon or something like that, and a, or a goat or an oxen. And I've often wondered, these are people often on the edge of starvation. Canaan isn't part of the rich, fertile crescent. It's a fairly unimpressive place. And yet these people willingly sacrifice a moderate proportion of their agricultural product constantly. So why do they do that? Uh, admittedly, I think you know, taking destroying the entire city of Jericho is an order of magnitude greater, but still on a continuum. And I've never found an answer for why these people sacrifice their agricultural product. Is it, I've never seen a scholarly paper saying, ah, yes, well, it does this and does this and does this. Yeah, the, like, why is there a why is there a psychological reason or even mm. a um, an economic reason for mm. this destruction mm. of a, a pretty significant portion of mm. their of their agricultural produce. Yeah. I mean, is there a social reason? Is it because this sacrificing uh, imposes some sort of social order and cohesion on the people? Uh, that's a possibility, but I don't know how. Yeah. There's a theory that I, you see, I, well, you know, I guess the in the hierarchy of theories out there, my main theory is that it just didn't really happen and that the writers of Joshua just, kind of made it up as they went but there is a military historian Richard Gabriel who who kind of gives a a interesting theory and a possible theory of what happened with Joshua that the the Hebrews I think he had written an entire book about this that the, the Hebrews were a mercenary group who had come from Canaan originally and they had this Canaanite religion. They had this Canaanite language. They go to Egypt, which that kind of fits in with the the actual history and the archaeology. They go and they they went and they set up into Egypt. And then for whatever reason, they leave. That gives us the Exodus story. And when they go into Canaan, they don't go after. If you look at a map of ancient, you know, basically, if we look and think about it in the terms of modern day Israel, they avoid what's the Gaza Strip, mm. uh, which is the Mediterranean coast, the what you you, you might yeah. call the south, um, south uh, western coast, mm. where the Philistines lived, and they had major, they had five major cities, the Pentapolis, they avoided those cities, because really, if you look at those major cities, the Philistines had a pretty organized structure and they were fairly well organized militarily. So that's a, for, if you're a raiding band, which kind of fits in with what Moses and the whole, that whole book of Exodus says, that's a really difficult target to hit a group of people who are organized. They have places they can fall back into they have mutual support amongst these five cities. So let's skip those and let's go. Let's skip over the Jordan River into the Jordan River Valley with these Canaanite kingdoms who are completely 
isolated from each other. Each one is their own kingdom. And the book of Joshua kind of gives hints of that, um, where Jericho kind of defends itself. And then after Jericho is taken, then those other kings try of the northern part of the Jordan Valley, try to join up together. And if you place it into that context, then Joshua goes and he takes Jericho, which is pretty much a, a, uh, oh, is that an airplane? That's actually a very good sign for us. We usually don't like airplanes, but airplanes are good. Let's enjoy the airplane right now. (laughs) First one today. It's landing, so I presume it's bringing, bringing in Australian citizens trapped somewhere or something yeah in march 2020 we're we're not going to complain about airplanes <clears throat> no nah. but so if we look at joshua he's taking jericho as a he's making an example out of jericho now does that temper you at all that jericho was the weak link would you agree with that yeah yeah I, i'd agree with that um I mean, just on the Philistines, yeah, they do seem to have been quite well organised. And presumably, even if they were besieged, they could support each other by sea and be in contact by sea. Whereas the Canaanites don't seem to have had any any cohesion at all, do they? It's very late where they get themselves t- together, as you said, into some sort of alliance and try to attack the Israelites. Uh, just one thing on Jericho. Uh, according to the current archaeology, there is no evidence that Jericho was actually in existence, occupied at any time that we can put to Joshua. Yeah. So mm. that's where everything gets tricky because archaeology does not line up with, with the textual evidence at all. So we're all, we're just really, um, you know, we're kind of, I don't know what the word we might, you know, we're definitely doing it, but you know, I'm not going to let the scholars off either. They're kind of making it up as they go along too. Uh, Well, that's true. I mean, archaeological digs in in Canaan are actually fairly recent. That is the past 50 years. Yeah. And they've only in that period worked out that there is no evidence for some sort of structured invasion of Canaan, which led to the widespread destruction of cities. The destruction layers just aren't there. The occupation just isn't there. I mean, I'm actually prepared to believe that Joshua is a complete fantasy invented for later generations to show that the Israelites were a great people. But I'm just annoyed that it's in the... I mean, I'm also annoyed by Samson, for that matter, the homicidal halfwit. I can't stand him. Yeah, we can always read... We can always dig Samson up again. Mm. I think Samson is in a lot of ways, you know, you know, Samson makes me mad because Samson is based, all Samson Samson is is a copy of Hercules. Hmm. Yeah, good point. And I I think that that's, um, you know, I'm sure that'll get a couple of a negative comment or two somewhere along the way. But I, I really do think that Joshua is a Syrian envy. (laughs) It's a funny concept. Oh, those Assyrians love the way they kill and murder. Oh, yeah. Um, Assyrian envy, yeah. And I think, I, you know, because the the Israelites in this group, they, you know, they co-evolved, you know, all these people, the, the Assyrians and the Canaanites, they all worshipped a similar type of religion. They all had a certain you know, interrelated language and certain interrelated culture, it makes a lot of sense that Joshua and they would try to glom onto that a bit, you know, because that was what the going concern was at that time. Um, You know, even if you fast forward a couple of hundred years after uh, either when Joshua was supposed to happen or when he was written, Julius Caesar wrote a whole uh, set of books about how he had done basically the same thing to the Gauls, and he's mm. proud of it. You know, that that was the, the thing to do at that time. Or even right through uh, the Middle Ages, the Crusades, the, yeah. uh, the 19th century colonial period. Uh, in my own country, we massacred the Aborigines, left, right, and center. What a terrible thing. So, it, yeah, it really was quite common. And actually, just one thing on Assyrian envy. The Israelites do seem to have had a thing for uh, the Assyrians because apparently the law codes and the Ten Commandments seem to be modeled on 
late Assyrian period treaties, which the Assyrians uh, imposed on their vassal subjects. And the key point is unique amongst various treaties in the Middle East. The Assyrians commanded their vassals to love them. Other people was just, yeah, obey us, pay your taxes. But the Assyrians said, no, you must also love the king. And that, again, is in, um, in the Bible. You are commanded to love God. So most scholars today say that a lot of the lawry stuff throughout the entire Old Testament is based on, I suppose, envy of the Assyrian vassal treaty. I think that's an interesting point. I think there's also an interesting point to be made amongst, um, it was really the three kingdoms that Joshua conquered. It was Jericho, I, and is it Gibeon or Gideon? Ah. Um, or is it, both of them are used interchangeably. Yeah, it's um, in the translations I've been using, the New Revised Standard Version, it's given as Gibeon. In Hebrew, it's Gavon. And I, so I, I found those Gibeon. are the those are the three big ones: is the Gibeonites, the I, and the Jericho. And Jericho gets wiped out really quickly. And it's an interesting. That was one of the ones that uh, Richard Gabriel, the military historian, he really goes into detail about how a group of mercenaries would have taken a city like Jericho that in the big scheme of things as it was was in the Bronze Age really wasn't well defended. It was a um, pretty small town that had what was called a casement wall. And a casement wall was that the the wall was the the defensive wall around the town was basically hollow. And inside of that hollow cavity of the wall, during peaceful times, it might be used for uh, storage of grain, storage of different commodities. People also might put apartment into there, or importantly for the book of Joshua, maybe even a brothel in there. And if the Hebrews had taken and gone in really quickly before if the if a casement if a city that's surrounded by a casement wall what those casements were really meant to do was those hollow spaces you would fill them up with dirt and junk and anything you could fill in there because those that's really hard to attack with siege engines you can hit them with all sorts of rocks from whatever the siege engines of that siege machinery of that time were and they can absorb all of that impact over the, you know, over the course. They're really hard to take a casement wall. But if Joshua had gone in there before then and made contact with that woman, what was her name? Um, uh, Rakaf, the, the prostitute? The, yeah, yeah, the prostitute. Yeah. If he had made contact with them and gone in there with, you know, basically a bunch of elite soldiers. I think that's where Richard Gabriel really falls down as he's mm. taking it as a, um, uh. you know, like as if a modern um, Navy SEALs or SAS <laughs> had gone in there, you know, maybe that's taking yeah. it a bit, a bit far. But I think that there is something to say that if, you know, again, we have to preface this in the model of that Jericho actually existed at this point. It's a weak point. You take Jericho, you make a major league point that we're going to destroy the heck out of Jericho. Then you know what? Gideon or Gibeon and I, you know, we're here and we're going to deal with you next. And that's really what they do in the book of Joshua is that then they form a confederation that they try to deal with the Israelites. Mm. Actually, just on Gibeon. This is my favorite part of the book because it's actually sort of funny. As you said, the, the Israelites have gained a reputation as mighty conquerors. And the inhabitants of the little town of Gibeon are going, whoa, these guys look like trouble. Okay, what are we going to do? So uh, they set out from Gibeon, a little town which is actually not far from where the Israelites are encamped at that time. And they come out in disguise. They're, they're dressed in ancient clothing, which looks like they've been traveling for miles and miles and miles. They've got worn out water skins. And they come to Joshua and they say, man, have we, we've been, we've been walking for months and we have heard of your greatness. And tell you what, if you won't destroy us, we will agree to be your subjects and slaves. How does that sound? And Joshua goes, oh, okay, cool. We don't, we don't even have to spend any effort on conquering you because you will be our slaves forever. Great. 
And then a couple of days later, Joshua finds out that the Gibeonites are not from some distant nation. They're just down the road. And he's outraged. <laughs> he's outraged that the Gibeonites are trying to preserve themselves from destruction. And the Gibeonites basically say, well, yeah, of course we said this to you. And we got your word in a treaty because we didn't want to be destroyed. And Joshua, I mean, that never actually occurs to him. He doesn't seem to have been the, the brightest bulb in the pack. So I find that a funny little story. So in the end, the Israelites agree, okay, we can't go back on our word, but you'll be hewers of wood and um, something of water and our slaves forever. And they go, okay, fine. It's better than being wiped out. You know who that reminds me of? The helots of the, um, the Spartans. Mm. You know, you're basically, all right, we're going to be the military elite and you're going to be our slaves who allows us to be the military elite again. Is that something that's being written in light of understanding, you know, who the Spartans are, who the maybe that's how the Philistines act again? You know, I'm not a biblical scholar, so I don't know this inside and out. But um, you know what? Honestly, a lot of the the scholars seem to be making it up as they go along, too. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's I mean, if you've listened and watched any of our collaboration along the way, you see that the scholars are working off of a lot of the same data that we are. And it's a little questionable because there just isn't anything to work off. Yeah, there's so much. The The time scales are loose and fuzzy. We can only rely on pottery for dating things. There's no people. And certainly the period from 1200 to 1000, the chronology is really dodgy, really dodgy. Uh, and, and yeah, so the whole, the whole period is a mess to examine and then write a history of. Then wasn't there a... Um a point in the text where Joshua kills some of the kings of the Canaanites. Oh, yeah. Yes, there which, is. I mean, that's not helping my case right now, but I think I have a point. I, I might have a point to build off of that if he really did kill these kings. Let me read you the passage in question. Let me read it to you. <laughs> this is after the Battle of the Five Kings, which is after Jericho and the kings have got together and said, yeah, these guys look like a problem. Let's do something. Uh, anyway, this is this is a battle which occurs outside of the city of Gibeon. The Gibeonites are not participating because they've sworn to be slaves to the Israelites. And this is the battle where the fame, where the sun stands still uh, for a day. Well, the, the passage actually doesn't say why and what the consequences are. It just happens. Anyway, uh, Joshua wins a great battle against the five kings. And then at Joshua 10.24, And when the kings were brought out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel, and ordered the army officers who had accompanied him, come forward and place your feet on the necks of these kings. And after that, Joshua had them put to death and impaled on five stakes. And they remained impaled on the stakes until evening. And at sunset, Joshua ordered them taken down from the poles and thrown into a cave. And I think that that there's so many examples along the way from that point all the way up until basically our modern time of humiliating kings like that in our own U.S. history. It just this one struck me because I'm doing a collaboration with another podcaster on something that happened in American history, the um, the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it doesn't directly have anything to do with Lewis and Clark, but um, uh Clark, William Clark, had an older brother, George Rogers Clark, who was re- he was really critical in winning the U.S. War Revolutionary War against Great Britain. And he doesn't really get a lot of attention because he really fought in the, what they would call Indian Wars. They he fought mostly Native Americans in what was called the Far West at that point, which was really nothing um, anything further west than Chicago. So the not any more than two thirds of the or a third of the continent over. But he um, hatcheted it using a hatchet of several Native American leaders, you know, kings. And he made a big deal of killing them himself. And I think that that relates to Joshua kings that you do this as a way of subjugating people. And it's not a popular way that we do things today. But by today, I mean post like basically 1960. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you've yeah. got to keep what we, you know, what 
what has in the basically the last 50 years, you know, if you're listening past uh anything past what your grandparents, because your grand great grandparents, this probably happened when they're in their adulthood, things like this. Um Things were very different the way you subjugated people. And it was just very commonplace not too long ago. And it definitely happened in the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. Yeah. I mean, if you want recentness, I mean, what is it, what's it called? The Lord's Resistance Army in Africa, which basically, I think it's still around, just goes around hatcheting people, uh, massacring them. So yeah, it still happens. That's what has happened throughout history is it's very ugly. But in the way I don't understand Josh, you know, I guess I in, in a way I do see Joshua's evolution that he killed everybody in Jericho to make a point. But then he enslaves the people, the next step of people, the Gideonites and the people of I. That does seem like the next progression. If that really did happen, that's probably how things would go. Oh, in the sense of, okay, the first city you make a total example of by annihilating. Yeah. And yeah, so you'll get less resistance. And then we don't have to annihilate the other ones because we've made our point. So we'll just take all the booty. Because how can he afford to after that point? Because how are the, if the Israelites are a band of people who are nomads, which that's textual too, that they don't have a land. They've got to feed their people someplace. They have to keep the Levites burning stuff someplace, and they're not going to do it with the Philistines who are controlling a major avenue to the west of them. It's not going to happen there. It's probably not going to happen too far to the east either, where you're getting into, uh, you know, pretty severe desert and other pretty difficult people. So you've got to do it in that Jordan Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have we got anything more to say or talk? Or... So do you think to wrap it up, have I, have I at least taken, have I taken hatred or loathing? Look, I'll, I'll take in everything on board. And the, as late as, well, probably last week, people have been doing horrors like this somewhere on the planet. Okay. I'll give you that. But my beef is still in a book, which is, which is to billions of people, the very, foundation of their morality, there is this. But I suppose I could take the attitude that we should be grateful. There's not more of it. Yeah, uh, There could have been a lot more of it in the Bible, and it's pretty much restricted to the book of Joshua. So let me say, it's not my favorite book. And I'm, I'm down to, apart, I'm down from hating to merely disgruntled. I would say for me, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've had a little bit more time on my hands to organize my bookshelf. I haven't put it in top of my bookshelf, but I also haven't put it in the recycling box either. It's in the, it's in the bottom. I'm not quite ready to throw it out yet. Okay. And I think that's probably that's maybe where they stood in the um in the canon too. Yeah. You can't th you really can't throw it out, but you, you can't throw it in the recycling box, but we'll put it in the basement. Yeah. Next to that, um, the cookbook that you haven't used in 20 years. We'll do that. Yeah. And maybe you could say that the book is redeemed by a second half, which is so mind dead deadlingly soporific, it cancels out the horrors of the first half. Well, it's been my pleasure, and we will talk to you soon. So long from us. 